Well, hey, friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Bibliophiles. I am your host, Ian Andrews, joined, as always, by the great luminaries of the Western tradition, <laughs> Adam, Megan, <laughs> Missy, and Emily. How are you Luminary. all today? Doing great. Feeling Feeling luminous. Feeling luminous. Feeling luminous. luminous. (laughs) You guys, I I feel like the whole the whole season has been building to this moment. I'm so excited to talk with you all about the great War and Peace, by which I mean, of course, the BBC adaptation, the miniseries, six parts that takes the War and Peace story in hand. And Andrew Davies, the man who wrote it. Now he's not the director, so we'll talk about the director as well. But Andrew Davies is a um, is a fantastic screenwriter who had a difficult task, as I'm sure you could all agree, yes. adapting one of the longest works ever written to the screen. Um, but before we dive into all of that, I have a very appropriate icebreaker question for you. I would like for each of you to cast War and Peace <laughs> exclusively from the members of our podcast. Oh my goodness. Now, this means you're going to have to decide on five most important characters. I was taking it the other way around. Like, yeah, I, I just didn't pick a character for each member of the podcast. Yeah, the most yeah. appropriate yes. character for each member. Of the I will podcast. allow it. I'll allow it. Who wants to go first? Emily, you should. You said you're ready. Yeah, go ahead, Emily. I'm mostly ready. I think that Megan is Natasha. Ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> I think that I knew Ian... it. <laughs> I knew it. I had to be. <laughs> I had to be. Oh, by the way, that makes me Sonia. So we'll start there. No. <laughs> oh yeah. Gosh. No, I'm 100% Sonia. Um, <laughs> Megan is the bright luminary, and I'm like the sh- shadowy, like, bitter <laughs> one. Craven little background. shadow in the background. <laughs> the faithful one in the background. <laughs> what goes without saying is that nobody's Maria. <laughs> oh, let's be no. honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one is Maria. Well, actually, anyway, I think Ian <laughs> is Andre. Mm. And I know that you really want to be Pierre, but you're not. You're Andre. Because... You're Andre. I wouldn't <laughs> have asked myself Pierre, of, but as either not. of those. Really? Oh. Well, the reason I chose Andre over Pierre is that Pierre has a really hard time with indecision. And that is not something you know, to struggle <laughs> with. You no, very much true. know your own mind. And so does Andre. Um, I think that dad is Papa Rostov. I thought that too. Yep. And I do actually think that mom might be Maria. <laughs> oh, Maria! No. Nice. Do yeah. I fall wow. off my horse at the end? No, that's, that's not what um, happens to Papa Andre's Rostov. Dad. Yeah. Oh, you mean Papa Rostov? Right, right, right. He's the Papa one who's like a happy one. The he just keeps giving generous. and giving and giving. Yeah. Okay. He's always poor. <laughs> <laughs> He lets his son beggar him, but you know it's still like the the father in the prodigal son story. Even though he's penniless, arms wide open. <laughs> it's okay. Sometimes oh, that happens. <laughs> wow, that's so interesting. That is so interesting. Okay, is anyone who who wants to go next? I mean, I, I have so many things to say about that. <laughs> well, um, I think I know. I think I know what I would say. I would cast Ian as Nikolai actually, oh, because yeah, of that's the. Better fun loving spirit and the general joie de vivre you know i think he's that that strikes me as an ian quality i would also cast dad as papa rostov because of i mean i think maybe because of the similar elements i think you would be father (laughs) and son in the in the book as well um i think mom would be the the battle axe character who's got the spirit of russia (laughs) I think I think she would be that lady, but I can't um, remember her name right it's now. Also it's also Maria, isn't it? Yeah, Maria. Yes. But it's that one. It's like the cool Maria that everybody wants to follow. Yeah. yeah, she's not in the in the miniseries, but I think she should be, and I think mom would play her. Cadillac <laughs> Spirit of Russia. I love yeah. that. I really I'll do. Take it. And I thought that Emily would be Natasha, so this is kind of fun. Definitely not. No, I don't don't have the the Singing Rostov. Voice? Hey, my bad. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Too soon. Whoa. Doghouse for you. Doghouse. Doghouse with me. It's the doghouse with me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is that everyone, Megan? Did you get through all five? I, who are you? Like, there's only. You oh wait, yourself. who am I? Oh, I didn't cast myself. I forgot to cast myself. I would. I'd be the director. <laughs> it's not okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, mom. Who's it going to be? Oh goodness, I don't know that I. I I needed more time to prepare for this because, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, that this is impossible. This is why this I texted you 15 minutes before the episode. I know. And I didn't look at my texts. I didn't oh, look at them. I see how that went. My head was down. So, um, 
So I love the things that you've said, except I'm not really fond of casting myself with a battle axe. <laughs> <laughs> I did me in a I, nice not? way, in like a Even spirit before, way. Battle axe be nice. Okay, I don't know me, how I feel about that. Let me pitch it to you. She's very rich. Everyone respects her and wants to be near her. When she walks into a room, they all jump to her beck and call. She's and the truth there. She the tells truth the truth fearlessly. Yeah. That's what makes her an awesome right. battle axe. So she and she's the she's mm. the truth sayer to kings and czars. Wow. <laughs> That all I don't remember her. Well, like the I rules of this game—the rules of this game say you can't be offended at people's choice. Okay, that I'm not offended. I just—I wrote offended. a new rule just now, and I think it's a good one. <laughs> uh, Will it make you feel better if, in my version, I have to be Helene? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, that would be horrible. <laughs> I was wondering if anybody <laughs> would cast themselves as Helene. She's <laughs> awful, isn't she? This is oh, getting. No. Ridiculous. This game has gone on long enough. This game has gone on long enough. Moving on, moving on. But you didn't go. No. How come I know. I skillfully evaded that. Everyone evaded it. I have to go. Well, I think I think a lot of the casting has been appropriate. Although I would have cast myself as either Nikolai or Papa Rostov. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think Nikolai is better than Andre on second thought. Yeah, Andre doesn't make any sense. Okay. I was just thinking I was I wanted to put you in a spotlight and I was thinking about the differences between Pierre and Andre but I forgot about Nikolai that makes more sense I actually think that there's not really a character that quite works for dad so what I'll yeah. say instead <laughs> thank you very much yeah you you have elements <laughs> you of both of the principle both war and peace <laughs> <laughs> you have elements of both Pierre and Andre um yeah. But I don't think it works for so the way I cast it is differently than the rest of you have been doing. And I love the way that you took it, which is whose personality lines up with who, and that's great. But right. I actually think you would play yeah, in, the, good. in the in the NFL adaptation. I think you would play Papa Rostov. And it's not yeah. because of your personality characteristics so much as it's because the role matches your physique and demeanor. When and I get to age. wear when I get to wear that hat, yeah, yes. I get to wear that <laughs> Papa hat. Rostov is bedroom older. cap, yeah. <laughs> But you do wear my you, jammies for the whole series. You in your middle thirties <laughs> totally could have played Andre. Too brooding. Yeah, I'm not I agree. a brooder. You can nope. do brooding. I could do it. Maybe I maybe could. Convince, I think I actually, if we think this authentic. way, I think Dad could have played Pierre. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. It's Soft hard and to imagine. Questioning, you know. Hard to imagine <laughs> think... a Pierre other than Paul Dano, though. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah I think so. Right. I might have cast you in as Pierre. I think that could work as well. Okay. Except for the so thing that Emily mentioned about the, yeah. Yeah, but he could totally play that. Well, that's a different question. Well, he insane. <laughs> uh, Let's cast happy go lucky. Never met a stranger. That works. Yeah. Wrestle a bear. I believe it. I feel like <laughs> yeah. we're getting to know each other pretty well right now. <laughs> I should ask questions like this more often. This is I know. Great. This is going great. Is could going I see you me. drunkenly hanging out a window? Uh, maybe. <laughs> 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 okay. And with that. We're going to move on into our discussion of the War and Peace miniseries. Now, this connects in a strange way to the previous episode because Andrew Davies was also the screenwriter on the Pride and Prejudice miniseries. Mm. Um, so his bona fides were established by the time he turned to, well, a pair of great epics. He turned to uh, War and Peace first. And then on the back of that success, he also did Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. So, um, so a guy that tackled, he's not afraid of difficult material. Let's put it that way. Um, I just learned this morning that Andrew Davies is 85 years old. So we've jumped from the, the Kenneth Branagh's of the world into the, um, the reigning and maybe their reign is fading Kings of screenwriting <laughs> when we turn to mm. Andrew Davies, but I'm assuming that you have all seen this, this mini series, correct? Oh yes. Oh, a couple times. Yes. yes. Oh yes. So hit me with some initial thoughts. What were you expecting going into watching this mini series? I had never read War and Peace, so I was expecting Andre to live. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, a great answer. You know, I recently recommended this series to someone, and I was so excited. And I was like, you're going to love it. It's so good. And you're going to love Paul Dano. He's the best. And they came back to me and were like, um, James Norton died, and it was not okay. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> that yeah, sh that, that shook me up the first time, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's that the great. answer you were looking for but that's what i have for you it's a great answer okay. <laughs> what about the rest well, of i i will admit to wondering how in the world 
they were going to manage uh, to take all of the philosophy of history that oh, I yeah. think War yeah. and Peace is justly famous for mm. and depict that in a movie. I mean, it brings up the same question we've been asking since the beginning of the season, right? What do you do? Do you do a voiceover of somebody reading the, the novel? Uh, do you put it in the mouth of someone who wasn't actually speaking it in the original story? How do you pay homage to what is, I don't know, 40% of Tolstoy's uh, words in the novel. That might be low, but yeah, it's a decent yeah. idea. <laughs> 60%. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's light on plot I, in places. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I will say the, the main thing, so I expected them to hit the the romantic relationships really, really hard, which they did, of course. Right. Um, and I thought that in doing that, it would be really reductive because in the original story, Tolstoy puts the story in the service of the larger idea that he has about history. It's right. basically an experiment in which he's able to contemplate what is it that moves history? Is it great men or philosophers or artists and thinkers? Is it the little guys who come against their will and foil their plans? Mm -hmm. Or is it, um, is it an X factor, he calls it? What is it? What is it um, that actually is responsible for the movement of history forward when there's so many bees in the hive, right? And um, I, I, I'm not sure that the miniseries manages to make that question clear. They really do major in the love story, which is lovely. I loved everything about it. I thought the cinematography was fantastic and their ability to compress 14 books plus two epilogues into, what is it, like eight episodes? Six. Si no, I think it's eight. Nope. Um, <laughs> anyway, we can argue about that later, but we don't need it to. We can look at we can relatively look it up, brief. I it was six. I looked at a <laughs> window into eight. our family dynamic, ladies right, and gentlemen. Here we go. Welcome to the Andrews. I seriously did. I just got on Amazon Prime and looked, and there are eight. There are eight installments. Maybe we don't actually know how it ends. Ian, maybe we didn't. Watch did it you all. never see the end? <laughs> no, I definitely have seen it all. <laughs> So you were saying, though, Missy? Right, I was Mom. just saying that they did a, a brilliant job of condensing the action of the story, but I think it's very difficult without some sort of voiceover like what you're talking about, Adam, mm. to um, to zoom out in a way that reflects the larger questions that the story was written to discuss. Well, I, you know what I would say about that? I totally agree. And I was wondering how they were going to do it. And I love the way you put it, that in the novel they put the romantic relationships in the service of this philosophical discussion. I think Andrew Davies does a neat switcheroo of that. Mm -hmm. And he manages to put philosophical questions to which he alludes every once in a while mm -hmm. yeah. in a variety of ways in the service of the relationships that make yep. a movie. And, and I, I realize that it's a, it's a different thing than Tolstoy is trying to do. Cause I think your characterization of what Tolstoy is after in his novel is exactly right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an experiment right he's gonna say here's my idea about the, the the wheels that move history let's try it out try this theory out in this crucible of human relationships like a petri dish right and i think the the screenplay does the opposite thing let's mm. try out let's see how these unspoken and hinted at assumptions about whether napoleon can actually affect the world you know, whether Andre's uh, impulses have anything to do with anything. Let's take these unspoken assumptions and see how they work out in a series of personal relationships. That's the thing that makes a movie go. Right. Yeah. And I loved it. I thought it was maybe a different thing, but if you've read the novel, you're, yes. you're watching this miniseries going, oh, I see what you did there. Mm -hmm. Here's the other that thing. Works. I, lo I love that comment because it, it actually serves two kinds of people. Um, if you've read the novel, you say, oh, this is great. And also it's kind of a balm to your soul, um, depending on how recently you read the novel, because, right. because the philosophical ruminations and the theory of history and all of that does take up a lot of pages of time where you're pining after Natasha. I mean, like Natasha is supposedly the main character of the freaking story and she's in it for like nine pages. Yeah. So not the main all character of that condensed, Peter is. Let's not and argue. he also very <laughs> absent. Also very absent. So, so seeing it all condensed is, is really fun as someone who has read the, the novel but then also it provides an entree to the novel for people that, that wouldn't otherwise pick it up because having seen it already and going to the novel, which is the way that I did it, I saw the miniseries first and then I picked up the novel. Um, it made me excited and sustained me through some of the longer uh, meatier passages. 
because mm-hmm. you knew it was coming and it was going to be worth coming, it. And it was going to be totally worth it. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it's, it's double-edged sword in that way. Cool. I think I would go one step further and maybe it's just to be fun conversation piece, but I think that the movie almost improved upon the book. Actually, I think <gasps> this adaptation improved upon Tolstoy's classic in that it chose what kind of a genre this was mm. going to be. Mm. And Tolstoy never did. Tolstoy tried to do <laughs> two books at the same time and sometimes with very little transition between the two and arguably with violence done to one or the other at a given moment. And he never did separate them. And I think Andrew Davies said, what a great companion novel. Read it if you'd like. It's about the love story, ladies and gentlemen. It's about personal relationships. And in fact, this story of relationships is what I'm good at. I think Tolstoy acknowledges that that is his his greatest strength in works like Anna Karenina. And in War and Peace, he gets distracted by a side project. And I think that his greatest gifts don't shine quite as clearly as a result. What do you think of that? That by your <laughs> is great. Well, no, I think but, it's blasphemy. Well, you, <laughs> wait, maybe. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Megan has her her, uh, her bona fides, right? You're right. You've you've read read it recently, right, Megan? Yes. Yep. I have read it recently. We've and read parts of it recently. We started it almost two years right. ago. <laughs> Some <laughs> of it has it's a little foggy now. I just I don't mean to say anything negative about the second book that he is also writing. The one about right. the philosophy of history is fascinating and well thought out and articulate. And his and analogies well that he uses are lovely and they touch on a variety of different studies, scientific and mathematical and historical and all of these. It's a very well-rounded treatment of the philosophy of history and causes. Um, I just think that he tried to do two books at once. Well, you, if you're going to say that, you'd have to say um, that Melville fails too because of all the cetology chapters. But yeah. what we decided, I haven't when decided we what I about, think about that. Yet. <laughs> well, we've talked about Melville um, uh, in Biblical Files before, and one of the things we've said is if if you discard the cetology chapters, you miss a major trope in the story because it fits in with um, with the discussion of the search for God, right in the whale. Yeah. So yeah. It, you can't really dismiss the cetology chapters they're there for a purpose and, and yet I when i was in that... college studying it with the hillsdale college professor he cut them mm-hmm. out and did not assign them and we read the whole thing without them or a rather lot of people do because one or two representative chapters and cut a lot of others in in other words he needed an editor to say no. this right here this will do your symbol justice moving along don't you think that they did that um for the purpose of time because it's a survey class and that wasn't the only novel you were going to study all year long. No, he gave a whole lecture nope. justifying himself on cutting out the cetology chapters. Oh, well, see, I'd have to go toe to toe with him. Look at- oh, I'm, I'm sure, sure you would. You would. Yeah, I, have no doubt about that. I have no trouble imagining that at all. Trying to imagine that in my mind. Yeah, no, no, no. But to, pull, to pull it back. Maria Dimitrievna. There she is, ladies and gentlemen. Battle <laughs> axe number one. The battle axe. Yes, we so to, to pull it back together, though, and draw a bridge between the two of you, I think Megan's comment is well taken, and I, I sympathize with it um, because I'm trying to steer the ship of our other podcast, How to Eat an Elephant, which you should listen to, by the way. It's really fun. Um, mm-hmm, it is. To its, to its just conclusion at the end of War and Peace. And it was. It has been a minute since page one, right. um, but I think I she's don't right. mean any disrespect either. Yeah, not at all. It's brilliant and wonderful. But I see. I see what you mean, Megan. And I also think that it probably wouldn't have the stature that it has now if it were only a a, a romance novel, right? I'm a sure love story. So um, I'm glad in any case that he tried both of those projects at once. But it sure does seem like two different projects. And I think Andrew Davies made a good decision in majoring in plot instead of majoring in ruminations on well and in any case would have had a hard time trying to do both of those things well, given I, wonder, the genre. I, I would love to um to have you guys think of if there's a way a possible way to um give a nod to all of the historical ideas uh the that portion of the meditation mm-hmm. through some fancy footwork um it, I think a voiceover I, think I, I was does. gonna say okay, I think so does what too. is it if he does it what go is ahead it? emily and i want to follow you well i um i am the great defender of tolstoy on our podcast but i will get off my high horse for a second to agree with megan and say that i think that he actually, Tolstoy actually does already a really excellent job of discussing his ideas in the plot that he does give us. And um, not only does 
Andrew Davies give us glimpses of Napoleon, who's actually a character in the story, and Kutuzov, yep. who's the hero right. of Russia, and who's also um, very much characterized in the miniseries very yes. well by yes. the excellent Brian oh, yeah. Cox. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole scene with Pierre, that, the one that comes to mind that I think really digs into Tolstoy's ideas of history is when Pierre decides that he's going to assassinate Napoleon. And he actually, Andrew Davies leans into that way more Mm -hmm. than Tolstoy does. And his idea that he's going to say, he's going to be the savior of Russia. That's exactly Mm -hmm. what Tolstoy was talking about. Yep, it is. It's the, it's the experiment idea. I'm going to take my idea. I'm going to put it in a character and we're going to see what happens. But I was going to say the the scene where Napoleon is frustrated and he's standing mm. there with all his advisors and just in a rage because he can't get what he what he wants and what his personality is used to demanding and getting. Yep. When he's in Moscow. You yeah, mean? exactly. He's about to turn back and give up in Moscow. And uh, I think that scene and the scenes like it that have Napoleon in them and then the one where Brian Cox's character, whose name I can't remember, a perfect a- little foil. Yeah. of um of great men supposedly great men leaning back and going well there it is my victory or right. well there it is mm-hmm. my defeat and it's yep. been handed to me by mm-hmm. the god Fate. of war oh yeah, the, exactly. he did a really good job with the scene where um Kutuzov learns that napoleon is leaving yes. moscow where he yes. falls to his knees and gives thanks to god or we are saved. when the yeah. when the um before the battle of bird you know when the train of uh, Russian Orthodox priests is marching by and he gets off of his horse. That's also, mm-hmm. that's extrapolated. That isn't, it's very briefly mentioned, but not nearly right. highlighted in the text. Not treated like that. Well, I think that minute when he realizes that Napoleon is retreating, that before he gets on his knees, he sinks back in his chair, if, if I remember right, and his body goes limp mm-hmm. and he relaxes into the realization of his victory. And you realize if you, if you know what's going on, he has just beaten Napoleon in a cat without game. getting out of his chair right. by retreating That's in a yeah. passive way. Yeah. yeah. But it's passive. It's utterly passive. In fact, his whole body goes slack. And I think that's, if you read the novel and you know what Tulsa is after, that's the, the screenwriter and the director saying, this is what we can do in this direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was just telling Ian before we got on that. <laughs> so before Paul Dano went to drama school, he was a Russian literature major for a hot second. And oh, wow. when they gave him the screenplay, his favorite novel is Anna Karenina. So when they mm-hmm. gave him the screenplay for War and Peace, he like he had never read War and Peace. So he read War and Peace and then he read the screenplay. Whoa. And like then that was before he was willing to commit to it. And he wanted it to be up to snuff before that he would commit to it. And he decided mm-hmm. that it was. I think that's pretty cool. That is cool. Wow. Well, um, I, I want to watch it again with that in mind, because of course, when I watched it, the first couple of times I was looking only at plot and the love story, which is what really plays best. You're sure. right about that, Megan. Certainly. That, you know, we, it's a plot, dri- movies are plot driven anyway. And what we want to see is the action and the developing love story. Um, but I would like to watch it again with an eye to how the director and the screenplay writer are treating this element of history. Because you're right, they, they don't, I mean, obviously there are lots of battles, there are lots of scenes with Napoleon and Kutuzov, but um, I don't know. I mean, I didn't come away from the, the screenplay thinking, yeah, yeah, they really covered that issue about history, <laughs> but it's not what I was really watching for either. I was looking right. for the yeah, you, you come satisfaction away thinking, of the romantic why can't story. We wear headscarves like right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I could wear a headscarf. <laughs> have, I, have I ever actually been at an outdoor dinner that was that comfortable? Can't imagine. <laughs> I don't think so. Could I get away with going around in my jam jams? Okay, jam bye. Jams. Have you guys finished War and Peace yet and How to Eat an Elephant? Have you read the epilogue? Not quite. We are we're working, we're on it. working our way through the epilogue right okay, now. Okay, so, so this, I don't mean for this to be a spoiler, but what oh, do you not already mentioned oh, about, my goodness. I'm not talking about action. I'm talking two about years. something that dad said. Two, year, two years. Two years. <laughs> this spoil would be it an now. epic I'm spoiler. Not gonna, I'm not going right. to spoil the ending, right. except to say that Pierre Bezukov, whatever, <laughs> Pierre Bezukov still thinks he's the center of history by the end. It's astonishing. I was rereading today just in, in, to get ready for our podcast, just kind of looking back at my notes and looking back at what I'd underlined. And there was a, there was a line 
in the second epilogue where he literally thinks that he has changed the whole world. <laughs> because of his actions. Well, it's because that he did like, there's a line in, um, I think Tolstoy has an introduction himself to the text and he says, this is not an epic. This is not a poem. This is not a novel. This is something in it's between. An experiment. I'm yeah. trying to develop a new artistic genre and basically his thought was that if this were if the novel were truly a representation of real life there would not actually be um introduction rising action climax denouement conclusion so that it would think. instead be like a funnel with little climaxes hmm. and we would end hmm. in the we would end unfinished mm -hmm. um and i think that <laughs> that's a great idea but if you're making a mini but it ticks series, off your readers you're probably <laughs> well yeah you're not, you're not, unless you want like a super <laughs> postmodern feeling mini series which is totally valid but also wouldn't correctly represent tolstoy i don't think then right he might have wanted that. to do something else but the novel is a novel when you get right well down whatever he was he wasn't a postmodernist. you know right he was definitely uh, kind of angling for a providential view of history in war and peace yeah so I think he, right. he was probably looking for a verisimilitude in that, right? Because, probably. Um, you know, unless the character dies at the end, we don't have his whole story. We get a chunk of life, which is also commentary on history that maybe we can't get far enough away to really see the hand that's moving everything and everyone. What do you guys think about the genre of miniseries that makes story or adaptation different than with film? I love yeah, it. I mean that's one of the that's one of the you conversations I wanted to press right today. Yeah, I, it allows them to elaborate, um, and you know we kind of talked about this when we talked about Pride and Prejudice because we were looking at the Keira Knightley version versus the BBC first version, right? That's longer, and we I, re I remember saying something like they both they're they're different. It's, you can't really compare them. Like they're like comparing apples and oranges because they're both wonderful, um, but they serve different purposes. And the truth is, the miniseries allows them to elaborate and to um, spend time developing characters and moments, and yeah. um, it gives them more opportunity, I think, um, to develop motifs. Yeah. In their scenes. I I think that it does a great job. It's a great choice for Tolstoy because of what you said a minute ago, Emily, his goal is to have many little climactic moments mm -hmm. and an episode of a mini series should have its own story arc and should be contributing to the larger story That's arc, cool. which is I a like great that. choice yeah. for him. Yeah, the episodic okay. element. Absolutely. Yeah, there's always that tension in a series, right? Between the the uh, the shape of today's episode and the, the arc of the whole, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the arc of the season, Right. Right. And then the arc of the show as a whole, there's there's uh, concentric story arcs that they're always working with. Yeah, so the fact that Anatole Karagin can be a character that just makes your blood boil and he's so, so present for the first two episodes and then you forget all about him for multiple episodes <laughs> in a row. Really that he comes makes, on back around. Well, yes, the fact that he comes back around again is really powerful because there's time mm -hmm. enough and conflict enough of another sort mm -hmm. to let you forget about him. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that was a great, it was really well done. I would never have forgotten about him if it had only been two hours, you know, because right. he was right. such yes. a horrifying villain at the beginning. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. I agree. That's a really good point. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. It, that episodic idea. Um, I went back to the, int the introduction and to the table contents in my war and peace to see, to remember, cause it's been a while. It's probably been, I don't know maybe a decade since I read this mm -hmm. the novel, you mean? Yeah. I, I read war and peace twice, but in close succession, one after the other and um, then put it down. And I thought about war and peace a lot. Because and I watched you like this suffering. I mean, I know, is this what, what in the world were you doing to yourself? You oh, I was, I was getting my master's twice. degree and it so was required. To. Yeah. Oh, okay. To read yeah. it twice first. Cause the first time that you read something, you're really basically looking at plot. Right. Yeah. And that's the way we're reading here. it. Well, well you I, read and it I think five that chapters, five at, a chapters a at a time for two years <laughs> and going really deep and all of that sort really, of thing. Really, really deep and you know, slow. That yeah. counts for sure. I read it um, pretty fast. Twice. Um, twice. Yeah. And the second time, because I already knew the plot, I was able to skip over plot elements and notice artistry and things like the argument that he's developing and, you know, right. that kind of stuff. Yep. Get but anyway, when, the historical philosophy. 
Yeah. And when I was looking at um, the table of contents today, you know, I had forgotten how many books are there in War and Peace. I noticed and remembered that they're arranged in books the way an mm -hmm. epic would be, right? And wondered if the books correlated with the episodes, like, you know, mm -hmm. they've they put all of book one and episode one. And the answer is no, except for imagine. a couple of um, incidents. First of all, there are 14 books and two epilogues. And I maintain there are eight episodes <laughs> on That's, Amazon Prime, at least. IMDb, IMDb says six, but it's, it's it's because six. it's six. Okay, I'm totally going to look that up. Like, <laughs> right. What I was trying now. to tell you is that I had, I was looking at it as I said it to you in the first place. I said there are six episodes while verifying my own information from the internet. <laughs> Well, how is that possible interwebs. when I just went through it this afternoon? I don't know. There are some. I'm looking again. I'm curious though. Like, I'm definitely about, curious. Like, the that we don't know. About. Chad, you can either leave this in or cut it. <laughs> yeah, oh, you I want you to leave it this in. This is a huge <laughs> argument. Okay, so I'm just saying. Here I am on Amazon Prime, looking at the Paul Dano War and Peace uh -huh. season one, and they have it divided up into. I kid you not, eight episodes. Hey, are the last two special look features? At the end. Are they special features? No, they aren't. Episode seven, Pierre and Andre fight on the front of Russia's greatest struggle against Napoleon, dot, dot, dot. Episode eight, in the shadow of tragedy, Natasha struggles to see a way forward. It's, I'm not, I'm not making it up. I'm looking at it. Go look That's at it wild. on Amazon Prime. That's subdivided. It's IMDB original. that says that there are six and Amazon Prime says there are eight. So she's who's right, right, you guys. I'm looking at Amazon. Who's right? It says eight episodes. Yeah, I oh looked at both IMDb and Amazon. So I don't know who's right there. That is crazy. They've divided it differently on those two websites. That's Just wild. FYI. Somebody give her a medal. But what I'm, you get a the reason I'm saying you this right. is because I went through, <laughs> thank you, I know. The, the reason I'm saying that is because I went through and compared each episode's contents with the, um, the table of contents in the original text to see how he managed to combine and what kind of artistic decisions he made. And it was really interesting um, to notice where he compressed and where he extrapolated, right? Where he, um, where he took his time, right? So like, for example, let's see, the one that talks about book eight, episode five is just book eight, nothing but book eight. It's expansive in its treatment of book eight. Whereas episode eight, covers books 11 through 15 and the epilogues, the, the epilogue, epilogue one and two. So he really like goes a distance in that last episode. Yeah, I have a lot of on. theories that will sound bitter if I say them out loud for why that is. <laughs> Let's hear it. Well, I think that Tolstoy roundabout book 15 or whatever that is begins to repeat himself over and over and over again. So much so that in a podcast where you're taking five chapters at a time, you can't help but say exactly what you said last week and again the next week, et cetera. You so I think Andrew Davies infidel. reads along and he says, we have heard this. This is true. It is another beautiful way of saying the same thing. Let us again. portray it once and well, ladies and gentlemen, and move on. <laughs> Sorry. I told you it would sound better. I warned you. I warned you. You oh, sound like a woman specific. that's read this too slowly. <laughs> I have read it well. <laughs> very well indeed. That is awesome. Okay. All right. So an interesting good. detail about Andrew Davies, who's the writer for this show, is that he um he gets some credit for kind of starting the move towards um long form novelizations mm -hmm. on screen. Uh -huh. Um he wrote, he was a co-writer on the original House of Cards show released oh, in 1990 on British television mm -hmm. that the house of cards, you all probably thought in your mind, yeah. Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright was based upon. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and the house of cards starring Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright is one of the first um, stream and binge heavy dramas that was released to onto Netflix. So he's actually connected with kind of the birth of the art form in some, in some ways, which I think is really oh, interesting. That's cool. I have often said that, uh, I think TV drama is the novel of our era. Yeah. Not that I want people to stop writing novels because I love them dearly, but, um, but it's, it might be my favorite way to watch a movie. Hmm. Quick question. Has anybody seen the, um, the old treatment of war and war and peace, um, the classic movie with um, Audrey, Hepburn? Audrey Hepburn? I have not. No, I've seen, I know of it. I've seen scenes in it. Uh, I can't remember the stirring climactic or the Karagan episodes, so probably yeah. not. I think it'd be interesting to compare the two. I've, I've not yeah, seen it, it myself. It's black and I'm white, interested. isn't it? I think it's black I and white. I think it is. Yeah, I think it's a black and white treatment. 
but now I want to go watch it. A lot of low ceilings, if I remember right. Yeah. Don't know why I remember that. And Luminous <laughs> Beauty yeah. because of Audrey Hepburn and all. Mm. Yeah. Um, we haven't talked about the score, the musical score. And That's I thought true. that that was one of the things in the BBC adaptation <laughs> of this that was most brilliant. I loved it. Yeah, me too. Me it's too. still on all I my playlists. I particularly like that as you swoop in over the battlefield covered in fog, what you hear in the background is a chorus of Russian men saying, yes. lo, 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 lo. <laughs> yes. I love it so much that when Emily and I are hanging out for a weekend, every now and then, <laughs> every now and then we'll just try to turn it on in the background and see if the other person notices, just really, really quiet. <laughs> and then just turn it up nice and slow until suddenly Russian men are shouting this song at you. No. It's so satisfying. Well, it's that part like the, really what does. It, what's it called? Rick rolled? Like Rick rolling somebody? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually with War and Peace. The way nerdier version of Rick rolling. That's always so funny. <laughs> I loved it because he managed to uh, give a nod to Russian culture and at the same time create this drama and suspense that is consonant with the epic nature of the story. Oh, yeah. And there are there these plaintive and haunting vocals um, that foreshadowed what was going to come and Absolutely. let a kind of gravitas to the drama that was going on on, on the screen um, that made you want to ask the big questions mm. of the, about the universals that he was contemplating mm. through this love story. Mm. Maybe not about history as a, as a genre, but as, uh, you know, what's the meaning of life and, you know, what's a good love and what good is love. All these kinds of things are like floating right. in the air with the music that Martin Phipps rights for it man that's I a great comment I, I sorry to cut you off emily but i want to i want to jump on that for a minute because the way that you put it a second ago um lens gravitas i think in some senses a musical score grants a film or a tv show its weight i really do think that that's true hmm. um and i'll take as my case in point star wars oh yeah which is arguably a mediocre ripoff of dune hmm. and i think without john williams it may not have been nearly as popular. Oh, no, well, and I'll I'll take your Star that. Wars and I'll raise you Cyrano, which in the last episode you suggested failed at least in part because yes. of the tone deafness of the score. Right? I think you're right. I think you're exactly mm -hmm. right. It, it, that's a really integral part of things. It's hard to wrap your head around sometimes, but you've done it. It does. Well, it, grants, it makes it elevates the whole piece, and I think Phipps mm -hmm. did a brilliant job. Possibly because of what dad mentioned in our last episode, that music is now integral to the art form and it didn't used to be. Now it's in right. every single scene rather mm -hmm. than only in heightening moments. Mm, and so it is. Another language that we're speaking at the same time. Yeah. I love that you said that it gives a cultural nod to the story because that's actually a really, um, that's a tight line that they had to walk because it's a British miniseries mm -hmm. so and right. like you know like we talked about last time that comes with its own set of preconceptions it's a historical drama uh, a period piece right done by the bbc so immediately just, you're just saying, this side Jane of Austen. a bonnet drama so <laughs> and this is like the work of of russian literature russian culture and, and history and right? all, the whole cast minus paul tano is british so they had to find some way to make it essentially Russian. And I do think that you're right. Without that yeah. stereotyping. That. Although they do right. have plenty of the really a little furry stereotyping. Hats, so don't worry. It's it's there for you. There's lots of furs. <laughs> yes. Lots oh, of great furs. Hats. But, spectacular but, furry hats. But you guys are all making that that statement <laughs> about music that is it's not more importantly than locating it in a particular culture. They're linking the music, the score to the the thematic. Right. Um, the thematic heft of the movie. It reminds me of the way Boz Lerman did it in The Great Gatsby that we talked mm, about yeah. in an yeah. earlier episode, right? Controversially, but but I think the score there was linked to a thematic statement, um, maybe regardless of culture. Right? I think he used mm -hmm. American music primarily and he was telling an American story, but the point of the music there was to say, um, was to make a cultural statement. And I think they're, the score of this War and Peace miniseries is doing a similar thing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's not true uh, broadly when it comes to adaptations. I wonder if it's a conscious thing for the screenwriter and the director to say, or the screenwriter to say, I'm in charge of telling the plot. The director to say, I'm in charge of motifs. And the, the composer to say, I'm in charge of high-minded 
thematic ideas. Yeah, maybe hmm. because music speaks along, without yeah. words. Yeah, right, a exactly. One, yeah. yeah, maybe a successful pairing of those three roles uh, goes a little bit a little bit like that. I mean, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which has come up in a couple other places, is a great example of that as well. Um, where the where the screenwriters coming along and saying, "Okay, let's take the important moments." And Peter Jackson says, "I got this with the costumes and the landscape of mm. of New Zealand, and we can make it feel this way." And then the brilliant musical score comes in and just put, ties a bow around the whole yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Who was trying to make a comment that I talked through? Emily. Megan. Megan. No, I just I was just thinking of Jane Austen and thinking of the composer's role as as really communicating the thematic heft, and I think we see that done well in the Andrews Davies Pride and Prejudice. But I also think that the piano forte is like the only thing that's played in the background ever in a Jane Austen film. And that as a result, it actually loses its power in some adaptations. Hmm. Um, I don't know how Andrew Andrew Davies avoided that or Dario Marianelli, who who Hmm. uh, who composed for the most recent one. It's still a lot of piano music, but he manages to have it be deeper. Hmm. That one seems almost stereotyped for Regency era. Oh, I think there are definitely stereotypes. So when Greer Garson plays Lizzie Bennett, in I don't know what it is the 40s or whatever she's a harpist did you guys know that really she doesn't play the piano forte she plays the harp wow in, in, in every set in the looks drawing like room yeah in the drawing room <laughs> the every drawing set room. looks like it's a it's the set of the super rich I mean it's a there's nothing lowbrow about it that mm. is crazy yeah that's free I didn't I don't charge <laughs> well, that, that was a cool detail dad I yeah. think it's You're interesting welcome. because um <laughs> I, I guess I've never really thought about music in a scene doing anything more than increasing atmosphere. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think in this, in this instance, I see it actually developing some of the major oh my goodness. tropes in the show. You're so right. There's one of my legend. So I am, when I am hanging out with my buddies and we're staying up late and talking about stuff, I every so often will just sort of get carried away and force them all to sit and listen to the last 45 seconds to a minute of the across the stars theme from episode two of star Wars. Mm. And, and it's a brilliant example of exactly what you're talking about. John Williams comes along and says, I have written enough themes connected to enough major characters that I can tell you the entire story of Anakin Skywalker's life in 30 seconds. And it begins with a theme that he wrote for little boy, Anakin way back in episode one, and then moves to the love theme and then moves to the the death march, Vader's mm-hmm. march, and you can you hear the whole story of his life in in thirty seconds. It is spectacular mm-hmm. and spine chilling. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it does. I think a, a really good composer is doing that when he mm-hmm. sets out to write the score. It's interesting yeah. that um, the love theme for War and Peace, the BBC one we're talking about it's the same it's natasha's theme instead of there being a specific one for andre and natasha and for pierre and natasha it's just point. natasha's theme both times that fits that thematically little... with the purpose of her character so i was much. gonna say is yeah. it economy on the composer's part or is I that thematic? So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because there's also andre's theme and pierre's theme and there's a lot of really beautiful tunes but uh I also, and this is something I've been chewing on, and maybe it'll come up again, how to eat an elephant, but um, Tolstoy is so good at writing women, as we've talked about, right, in in Anna Karenina in particular, Um, but in War and Peace, despite the brilliant characterizations of them in scenes and and the way that they're affecting people, I do think War and Peace is kind of about men, Mm -hmm. and I have wondered if Natasha doesn't disappear for three quarters of the novel because she's kind of not the point so much as Pierre and Andre and Napoleon are mm-hmm. the point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I agree. So, and I wonder if that knows that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wonder if that's why we subconsciously get frustrated. Yeah. But she does long about five together. sixths of the way through. She's still yeah. the touch the touchstone of the novel though. But I think what Ian's saying is that she doesn't get enough attention. Right. right. The touchstone yeah. ought to be more central. Yes. <laughs> that's true. I do think that's true. Well, is for a guy a guy that can write a, a, a woman as compelling as Anna Karenina should have had more lines of Natasha. I'm saying he got Megan. a little distracted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How can you be distracted from oh Natasha? Goodness. She's one of the most compelling characters of all time. And he basically was like, mm, but historical, you know, philosophy. Well, I think it's because Pierre was. 
he was distracted from Natasha for a good portion of True. the story. Ooh, that's a smart, that's a smart that he was, yeah. Well, I can't argue and, that with you. Until later. So, you know. That's very, I think that's a great comment. So true. That's, wow. All right. All <laughs> right. You win. I love to win. Ha, I know you do. <laughs> Eight episodes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, well, um, you guys, thank you for your comments, as usual. And can we fun. just all heartily recommend that all of you listeners go and watch the War and Peace miniseries. This is the only topic on which I have ever said to someone, please go watch this before you read the great classic all-time great novel that it is based on. And I would say, I'll still say it now. You should yeah. go watch this first because it is only going to heighten your enjoyment of the novel. And it will provide you an amazing opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to listen to the soundtrack while you read the book for two <laughs> years, which is what I have done. Which is a <laughs> Every great time I open War and Peace to read it again, you hear those Russian men. No. No. <laughs> Like it comes out of the awesome. page just like a music yes. box that's open. Exactly. <laughs> that's oh awesome. my goodness. Uh, well, oh. I, I totally agree with you. I think everybody should go watch it. And I just want to add, everybody should also go read it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you like, should. Watch oh, the yeah, movie definitely. doesn't stand in the place of reading the book, but they complement one another. In this case, they really do. Agreed. All right, then. Well, thank you all for joining us and thank you listeners for participating and listening along. Uh, please drop us a line on any of our social media handles and let us know how we're doing and let us know what book you'd like to hear us discuss in some future episode. And between now and then, we wish you all a grand evening and a happy reading. Happy, happy reading. reading. Happy reading. <laughs>